So let me tell you a little bit about our special guest. James Booth is the domain broker who runs the brokerage Phenom or Phenom.com. I'm actually never been quite sure how to pronounce that. He's cleared over $30 million in sales before he turned 30, and he did over $10 million of sales in 2019 alone. James and his team are not just about investment, but helping brands evolve online, starting with that very first crucial step, scoring the perfect domain name. So please join me in welcoming James Booth to the stage. James? Okay. 
Wow. And so, and you were then based in Singapore? Uh, yeah, and I said, look, I'll, I'll take the job. Wow. Went back to London, packed up my stuff, and just started a, a new journey in Singapore. Wow, awesome. Well, so that's a good segue to how did you get, how did you transition into the domain business? Yeah, so after Singapore, I moved to the Philippines and tried to work for a wealth management company in Manila, which was a, a terrible decision. <laughs>
So, do you speak other languages other than English? Uh, Just uh, Filipino, basically. Filipino. So, how were you doing the transactions with the, the, the Chinese buyers? So, I met like a, a really good contact in China that speaks very good English, and he is basically my <coughs> liaison to all the Chinese market. Ah, fantastic. And is that somebody that was in the domain industry? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so they were, okay, so they, they were all already known by some of the, uh, the, the Chinese domain specialists? Well, the, the, yeah, not the Western market. Not the Western yeah, market. Okay, so it was China. kind of a, a really good partnership there in terms of bridging the, the gap. Exactly, right. yeah. Is there, is there a particular buy side transaction that you um, I mean, there's been, been several good deals in terms of what selling to like an end user or selling to an investor. Well, this is a this is a name that you hunted down and you were like really proud of getting it. And it, 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 whether you ended up flipping it or not, that's a different. That's the sell side. But I'm just wondering if there was an acquisition that you're like, well, you know, you're so proud of having. I mean, there's been some, some two letters like uh, ix.com, do.com. Do.com. Yeah. So that. Now, was that owned by like a Salesforce or somebody like that? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. But you bought it from Salesforce? Yeah, I got it off them and then ended up having to flipping it to a bureau. Okay, company. so you got to tell me, how do you how do you <laughs> convince Salesforce to sell the domain name, a super old domain like that? I think the English accent helped. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, is just get the right person on the phone, you know, tell them you know, you're not using it. Is a, a decent cash offer. Just convincing them to let it go, basically. How long did that process take? Uh, I think just a couple of weeks. Really? Wow. Yeah, you see, you make it seem so easy. I, <laughs> maybe it is. I don't know. I and haven't had my experience. Here's what the main is all about timing. Okay, so tell me about that. What, 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 timing for who's the buyer to sell? That's timing for everyone. You know, if a company is you know looking for <laughs> cash flow, if they're not using the asset, if they're not even aware they even have that asset, a lot of these. Big companies, they even know they own some of these quality domain names. So if you say, look, you know, here's a cash offer on the table, we can get it completed this week. You know, a lot, a lot of people will just be like, okay. No. So are you finding as a, a buying strategy, letting the seller know that you know you can give them the full purchase price within a few days, get it signed yeah. into escrow. That's that can sufficiently motivate them. Definitely, yeah. Wow. A speedy transaction <laughs> always helps. So let's, we were talking about on the buy side, how about a sell side transaction that you just like are really so proud of? One recently actually, which is probably the hardest deal I've ever had to close was IJ.com. IJ.com, so you were trying to sell IJ.com and you owned it? Or no, no, it was a, a client owned it. Client owned it, okay. Yeah, and it was for a, a, a Chinese real estate company which spoke no English at all. So the Chinese real estate company wanted it to? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was, it was a nightmare really, but it was back and forth. They were like, okay, we'll, we'll pay, this is what we'll pay. Um, then they're like, we can't get the money out of China. So then I was putting them in touch with people at other brokerages in China saying, look, they'll help you for a, you know, a small fee. And they ended up flying to their offices, signing contracts, then backing out of that. And then, oh, wow. and then they decided, to, oh, we're going to use our own bank. And then that took like two weeks for the Chinese bank to sign off. FX rates, and it was just a nightmare. Eventually, it got done. Well, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Are you able to reveal the, the dollar figure on that? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, public. It was 550,000 US. Oh, so they. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's well, not a huge deal at the same Yeah. <coughs> but the market right now was good. Well, they were the clients, so they got yeah. the name. So, um, because of your having worked in sort of financial space, do you <laughs> find that that helps you with your work as a broker? Oh, for, for sure, yeah. Having the, the sales experience and you know different techniques and things definitely helps. Great. So Joe, can you put that photo up? What photo? What photo? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so some of you may have seen this photo, but I told you how like I've been wanting for years to meet meet the perhaps real, perhaps not James Booth, the legendary James Booth. Uh, and whenever I would think of James Booth, this photo would pop in my mind. Now this photo, uh, I well tell, tell me where this photo is from. Because we've seen it on Domain Gang, so Theo the Bell is oh, It's Theo from Domain Gang, I'm sure he's got it on his wall somewhere as well. <laughs> he's, he posts it everywhere. Okay, and it's, so he got it from your Facebook? Yeah. He got it from your Facebook? Yeah, it's from him stalking my Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what's going on in this photo? What, what are you celebrating here? 
I think I just sold a three number dot com when I was in Australia traveling. I was like backpacking you through travel? Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was backpacking through Australia and uh, sold a three number dot com. I think I was drunk. Uh, and sold, it, <laughs> sold it on the phone, like trying to speak to a, a Chinese guy while I was drunk and closed the deal like in the club. Wow. So I bought, bought the jam and, and, and was this how far into your was this year one, year two? Of, uh, like just looking at that picture a few years ago. <laughs> well, I love that photo. Whenever, whenever I think of you, I just it just it's so celebratory. I think it captures captures your your spirit of the adventurous and celebration. Because one thing I, I will say is uh, I, I I feel this way as a broker is we sometimes don't celebrate our victories. You know that making that sale, making that acquisition. <laughs> We sometimes get so caught up moving on to the next project, we don't celebrate. So one thing I actually, oh, I, don't think anyone, I admire about you is that my sense is that you you celebrate your wins. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you get could, after in life. Well, but people, a lot of people forget to do that. So that's something I, uh, you know, the way I learned from you is I try to remember, okay, I should celebrate my wins this morning. So I love that photo. So, okay, Joe, you can take the photo down. We don't want to torture uh, James. Uh, <laughs> nice. So, um, uh, my, 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 my last question in this part about talking about you as a broker is I want to understand in, in late 2019, so you rebranded your brokerage business from BQDN to Phenom.com. Yeah. And I, I, I was going to ask you about that, but I understand that there's even more to that story. So, so you know, help me understand what's going on there with Phenom.com. Well, I, I had to sell Phenom.com last week. <laughs> you had to sell it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I got an offer I couldn't refuse, so I've had to, you know, another rebrand coming out. Another rebrand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, I, I love the fact you were using this phenomenal domain name for your brokerage uh, brand, but I was also kind of like, well, aren't you, you know, aren't you sitting, aren't you kind of tying up really amazing inventory? But uh, apparently the right offer came along, and you're going to be, have you fixed your new brand yet? Yeah, it's so for now. Okay. I see. It's, uh, but it's under, you're, you're still in the stealth mode? It's, it's the main booth for now. The main booth, okay. For a couple of months, okay. and then we'll rebrand. Okay. So, <laughs> well, you know, one of the challenging things with, with, with trying to reach James is it does seem like your email address changes every six months or so, so it's hard to keep track of you. Well, you know, you're moving around, but that's okay. All right. Um, now, what do you like most about the work that you're doing today? What is there not to like about this industry, really? I don't know. Well, tell me. Is well, there something you don't like about the industry? No, no. I mean, working from, you know, in a wealth management job from nine to five, being told what you can do and things like that, to having this freedom to work from a laptop anywhere within the, in the world, travel the world, you know, it's a dream job. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it was, uh, I was working uh, at Two Cows Managing a Domain Portfolio, a fantastic company, but I, not by, uh, I got to work with different buyer and seller brokers, and I saw um, you know people that seem to be traveling the world with their laptops doing deals. And it's like wow, this is, you can actually make a living doing that, and so that that kind of eventually inspired me to to resign from Two Cows and start Name Ninja. So uh, uh, it, it is it is quite a remarkable industry that, 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 that we can do that. So um, I want to now pivot and talk a little bit about sort of domain broker trade craft, and uh, obviously you don't have to reveal any anything you're not comfortable. Feeling, but one of the things I'm always blown away by uh, is you seem to have this uncanny knack of acquiring amazing one word dot com domains, which generally I don't think are officially on the marketplace. It just seems what, what happens, I see, because I'm also stalking you on Facebook, is that it's like there's James announcing he's just acquired whatever dot com, and I'm like, that was for sale? Like, oh my god. So tell me, how do you, how do you pull that off? I don't even know. <laughs> no, um, no, it's just a persistence, I guess, especially dealing with big companies. And, you know, a lot of domains, you know, they've got faulty viewers of information. So it's all about picking up the phone, I think, to get these really killer names. If you pick up a phone and call someone, they actually hear a voice rather than every other Joe blog sending emails, then you, you definitely have that edge. So. So it sounds like one of the strategies you're using is you're not relying solely or exclusively on email. You're no. reaching out on the phone, yeah. finding out who the right person is. Yes. Are you, uh, like how are you identifying the names that you might want to pursue? 
Yeah, so we'll basically compile like a, a list of, you know, go through like the dictionary, for example, and make a list of all the, the quality one word domains and first send them an email. Then if no reply from the email or if the email bounces back, then pick up the phone. Right. Simple as that. And uh, are you kind of, are you always generally looking for the harder to acquire <laughs> names? Is that sort of the ones that you kind of get? Well, it falls in my lap, really. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously the, the harder to get names that are more rewarding for sure once you do get them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like Firefly, Jellyfish, things like that from Microsoft. Extremely hard to get names. Right. And yeah, congratulations on getting those ones. Do you still own those? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, I didn't. It should be more like, no, I sold it. <laughs> Most names I know are flipped pretty quick. Okay. That also seems to be kind of a strategy that you deploy, which is. Yeah. Really don't tend to sit on inventory that you hope to sell, you move it fairly quickly. I mean, the, the really good names we'll, we'll try and sit on and you know, wait for an end user ourselves, but you know, it's all about cash flow and being like a broker and also an investor, you, you need to keep your cash flowing to acquire these better names. And, you know, it's a strategy that works for me. Now, you, you say that with, um, you know, like it's sort of second nature to you, but I think it is second nature because of your finance background. I yeah. think a lot of demainers, even quote unquote professional domainers may not really fully pay attention to their cash flow. So yeah. I, I think that you're you're bringing a, a financial due diligence to this that uh, I think a lot of people could benefit from. Yeah, and I mean sometimes you have to cut your losses as well. You can't not every domain investment has to be a win. As long as like nine out of ten are wins, you know, as long as at the end of the year you're doing well. Well, you, since you brought that up, I remember a, a couple two three years ago I saw. Uh, post or a comment by you, and it was on name pros, and it always stuck with me. I'm paraphrasing here because I, I couldn't actually find the, uh, the original thing, but I think it was from you, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. And you uh, you announced that you had sold a domain name, um, and I, I, it was, I, maybe it was a two word document, it wasn't like a super high value name, um, but you announced you'd sold it, and uh, you were very transparent about the fact that uh, it sounds like you. Maybe you sold it for five thousand, and you made five hundred dollars. Um, and you made the point that you sold it for a profit, yeah. and, and you were happy to have sold it. Some people might say, "Oh, you sold. You should have made more money on it." Um, but that always struck me. So, can you talk a little bit about how you measure success? At the end of the day, like, I will do a hundred thousand dollar deal for a thousand dollar commission if it means that I get that deal, because any cash is cash. You know, it, it doesn't matter on the amount of money you're making as long as you're making. Yeah, and, and, and that just really kind of resonated with me. So when you're looking at names to acquire, particularly for your own portfolio, how do you set the acquisition budget? Uh, in terms of my own personal portfolio? Yeah, like how, do you, how do you decide how much you're going to spend and what your maximum is on that particular target name? I think mean, I mean, just down to experience what I would value the name at. And, you know, I, I wouldn't personally spend more than a, a couple hundred thousand on a name because I don't have that sort of cash flow to do so. So it's all about the balance and managing what you can afford to do. Are you also, so leaving aside the fact that yes, you have to have the money on hand to buy it, are you sort of thinking there's a threshold, there's sort of a delta between what you'll pay and what you think you could quickly sell it for? Or yeah, I mean, I'd always like to buy a that I have that chance to flip it if I need to. Okay. For a so, so you almost you almost have that backstop of, I'm pretty sure I can sell this for a little bit more yeah, than exactly. I'm buying it for. So and do you hold to your max budget, or do you sometimes kind of sometimes go over? Okay. Yeah. And are most of the acquisitions um, from an individual or company, or are you picking stuff up and drop for auction? No, it's so generally from either another investor or a company. I don't, I don't do much auction stuff or anything. Okay. So uh, obviously, people know you don't hide the fact that you have your own portfolio. Um, does the fact that and lots of other also buy names for themselves and have their own portfolio. Um, do you ever find a, a, have a situation where a buy-side client might feel the fact that, that you own your own portfolio, that you're kind of somehow competing with them? Has that ever come up? Or? No, that has never come up. Yeah. It's a, an industry that I know and love, so why, why not invest in it myself? I think it shows confidence to people mm -hmm. that you believe in these names yourself and you are putting your own money up. Well, also, if, if they engage you to acquire a specific name,
do you find is like the hardest part of negotiating either the purchase or sale of a domain name? I ask that because a lot of people think, oh, it's got to be about the money. But I, is, is, is it always just about the money? No, like, like I said earlier, it's, it's also about the timing, you know? Some people need the money for certain things at certain times. And if someone doesn't need the money, then they're less likely to let go of a name, especially if they've had it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, a, in a case like that, where they're sort of, they don't need the money, they're not in a hurry to sell, do you, <laughs> do you kind of park it and sort of think, oh, I'll check back in two years or five years, or do you give up? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll always do follow-ups and things, you know, and, you know, every, say, two or three months and say, look, Here's my offer. Would you like to accept it now? Or, you know. So you were talking earlier really about persistence yeah. being sort of a secret to your success. So yeah. is that an example of that? Oh, for sure, yeah. And are you Follow, are you, following up with phone calls and things? Yeah. yeah. Um, and do you use any other communication methods to uh, to uh, reach these people? No, I just uh, just calls and emails. Okay. Cool. <laughs> not showing up to anyone's houses. No, you're not talking. <laughs> okay. All right. Leave that to Theo and I. <laughs> so, uh, a couple times when you've done um, like podcast interviews and things, you've talked about the importance of trust, trust in the transactions you do, which I agree, you have to have trust on the side of the buyer, the seller, whichever side you're on. Um, but how do, you, how do you establish trust when you're calling somebody from the Philippines or from the Dubai and they're in the States or Canada? So you're this stranger on the other side of the world. Uh, how do you establish trust with people to get deals done? Well, once again, I'm doing the English accent help to her. <laughs> so tell me about that. I, I, I think it's the, the secret to my success. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 are, what are the uh, traits that people are associated, associated with the British accent? I don't, I don't know. I think it just uh, builds trust. <laughs> I should. I, I, I now regret losing my British accent and having my Canadian accent. Okay, that, that's really I, I can't think of anything else why, why it works for me. But. So, I mean, I, it occurs to me that you have a really nice telephone voice. I used to work in radio, so I can say that without sounding kind of too weird. Oh, uh, I'm I'm a <laughs> you have a face for radio. Okay. No, you do have a really great, great voice. So, combined with the British accent, so the phone thing, uh, I bet that's really. And it, what, what else? Okay, so they're kind of like, okay, I like this guy, this British dude sounds sounds real, sounds legit, uh, but they might not be not be sure, right? So, yeah. so then then well, how do you prove to them that you're the real deal? Well, I can re refer them to like articles and you know podcasts about me that they can listen to. You know, like, all, all these little things establish trust. Right. Okay. Um, how transparent should a broker be when they're Say when you're going to buy, you know, are are you letting them know your budget at some point, or if you're representing a buyer client, or if you're asked, well, who's your mystery buyer, James? How, how transparent are you? Or should you be? Uh, in in terms of in terms of what, sorry. In terms of revealing information to the let's say the domain sellers. Okay, I wouldn't inform the seller this is the client's max budget. Right. No. But if you get asked, well, who's your, who's your buyer, James? Like, you know, you must be buying for somebody. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's, that's obviously confidential, and the, the client is willing to offer you this amount of money. Right. Is this something of interest or not? Mm -hmm. The buyer is irrelevant. Right. That's what I'm saying. Actually, so buyers are relevant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, something I'll say is sort of like, well, if you're worried that the buyer can pay the amount that we're talking about, yes, they can pay the amount that we're talking about. So don't worry about that. So let's talk about on the selling side. So you got and you've either acquired or it's in your portfolio like a really amazing name and now you're trying to find a buyer. Um, what's the biggest obstacle you typically face when you're trying to sell? Uh, I mean the wholesale market can be tough because a lot of people you know aren't paying the, the prices these days. Um, in terms of end users I, I don't do any outbound sales generally. Um, so it's all about just waiting for someone to come to you and solve that problem. So it's your it's the lean back, wait for the wait yeah. for the whole so and, and are the buyers sometimes represented by buyer brokers? Uh, yeah, sometimes, yeah. Okay. So maybe you'll work with them and uh, that's great. We haven't, I don't think we've yet had the opportunity to talk about the other transactions. I know you did actually, it's funny, um, I, I, not really a client, but somebody approached me and they had a really good uh, three letter dot com and, uh, and I, I, I suggested some brokers they talked to to sell it and then I think a year later I checked in with them and I, you 
you've actually bought the name from them, which I thought was pretty cool. And they were asking me about you. So I thought, well, I don't know if you really exist, but I think apparently you bought your name. So, okay. Who, uh, uh, who do you think is the biggest misconception about James Booth and what you do? No idea. <laughs> that you don't exist, maybe? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've been going to a few conferences for the last few years. So. So, uh, so you're, okay. <laughs> who inspires you in this industry? Um, I mean, obviously, Andrew Reisner is, is the best, I think, of, of what he does on the broker side. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of inspirational people in the industry. But for me, more of it, like, as a broker and a seller, you know, I... So right. you look at, look at those folks that have been doing it yeah, a bit course. longer and... I mean, a lot of people have been in the industry for say, 20 years building up amazing portfolios. It's quite tough when you're relatively new to the industry in a few years to try and build yourself up, build your name, build your brand. Well, you did that relatively quickly, and I think that's what really uh, caught, my eye, caught, caught, caught my eye and the eye of a lot of people. was sort of like, who is this James Booth guy? 